I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, a U.S. delegation is headed to Israel to jumpstart moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Israel is refusing to extradite an Australian principal accused of sex crimes. And be careful what you do with your cell phone because an Israeli company now has a way to unlock any smart device. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Looks like the White House is getting the ball rolling on transferring the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. An American delegation is set to land in Israel next week to coordinate the move. The delegation is expected to consist of lawyers, logistical staff, diplomats and engineers who will together lay the groundwork for the country's embassy to be moved to a consular affairs building in southern Jerusalem. The State Department is planning the official move for May 14th, just in time to coincide with Israel's 70th Independence Day. But because the process will take much more time, for now the U.S. will be converting a consulate building in Jerusalem's residential Arnona neighborhood as a temporary solution. Officials initially said it would take six years to construct a new embassy, but the White House has moved up the date by promising to simply convert the current Jerusalem compound. The United States originally asked Jerusalem to provide a large plot of land to build a new embassy, but we're told that there just wasn't any plot in Jerusalem that met U.S. security requirements. The White House had reportedly been seeking a 25-acre plot with no other buildings or factories in the immediate vicinity. Now the U.S. is expected to demolish the former diplomat hotel located next to the Jerusalem consulate and build a new embassy in its place. White House aide and President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is the topic of major speculations this week, as the White House reports that Kushner's security clearance has now been downgraded. This also comes just at the heels of Kushner's communications director, Josh Raffel, stepping down for family obligations in New York. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Now, Aaron... Kushner has been working for a year now on a special clearance through President Trump. Yeah. Couldn't Trump just extend it? Didn't he have the ability to do that himself? So, yes, the answer to that is yes. He could use his uh, executive authority to just give uh, Kushner and, and, in fact, anybody else access to whatever secret clearance, you know, uh, documents that he wanted to show them privately. That being said, he did indicate earlier that he would not interfere with Kelly's assessment, with the assessment of his clearance. Um, but, of course, that was before... The answer came out. Right. So now, what about any actual potentials for, for leaks, though? Because if Kushner's clearance was downgraded, then some reason must have been found, right? There, there so, must have been something So there, was, there wasn't any specific reason given, but there was a potential for a leak uh, yeah. in, in uh, top secret you know, uh, information, particularly a new report that just came out that shows at least four different countries had been looking at ways to leverage positions and over what, Kushner. Well, I can guess one of those countries, but what are the countries? Right, so, yeah. so there's Israel, there's the yeah. United Arab Emirates, there is China, and there was Mexico, and there's, and, and it's worth being said that none of them, there's no evidence to show that any of these countries acted on this information, yeah. but that they were compiling ways to potentially use Jared Kushner to influence United States policy. They were going to go through his financial dealings, his lack of experience, and things like that. Right, I mean, he, he's, he's a young man. All right, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, well, after three days of protests and calls to nix a proposed Israeli tax measure, Christian leaders have reopened the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The church is known by many as the holiest site in Christianity, and it finally opened up its doors at 4 a.m. this morning to some very happy tourists. It's exciting because I was really excited to pray at the tomb of Jesus Christ, uh, something that I haven't been able to do yet, so it's very exciting to be able to come back after three days of it being closed. Thousands of tourists have been forced to pray outside the church for the last three days as church leaders protest against the Israeli government's proposal to seize church land that's being sold to private investors. They're also protesting back taxes on commercial properties that they apparently owe. Well, now government officials have just announced that that won't be happening anytime soon, meaning the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is now open to the public again. <laughs> نفتح كنيسة القيامة بأمر من رؤساء الكنائس
The government has announced that they'll be forming a committee to actively work with church leaders on their concerns regarding Israel's plans to tax commercial properties that are owned by the church. The regional cooperation minister Tzachi Negbi will be leading the committee, and the Jerusalem municipality is going to suspend tax collection for now. But Israel remains adamant the church must pay back the $180 million in property taxes that it owes. Only houses of worship will remain exempt. A delegation of 40 Orthodox business leaders from the United States have just arrived in Israel and they're calling on the Israeli government to reduce the influence of American Reform Judaism in the country. Joining us in the studio to give us the perspective of the Reform Movement is Rabbi Meir Azari. Erev Tov. Erev Tov. Thanks Almost for joining us. Almost Chag yeah, Sameach. Um, so, you know, the Orthodox delegation is saying that they're contributing more to Israel than the Reform and Conservative movements. What is your response to that? I think it's funny. It's funny. Uh, they claim uh, in the article that uh, they are bringing about 500 million to uh, the state of Israel, which is fine. Uh, but if you look carefully about uh, the article, to the article, you'll discover that most of the money that they claim that they bring to Israel, it's for their own education and their own people coming from the states that are living mm -hmm. here. At the same time, the state of Israel contributes a lot of money to the ultra-Orthodox yeshivot and to the people coming to learn in Israel. I, I, I wish they would bring more to Israel. This is not a competition about who is bringing more, but we are bringing a lot to the state of Israel. The so, contribution of the reform movement well, and the conservative like movement yeah. is enormous. Go to Machon Weizmann, to the Technion, to the Hebrew University or Tel Aviv University. You won't find among the donors ultra-Orthodox Jews. They will give their own money to their own people. We are giving to what is called Klal Israel. And we would like very much to have them taking responsibility to Klal Israel as we are doing that. Well, here's my question. What do you feel is the, the end game here for these Orthodox business leaders that are coming here? Um, what is the current relationship that exists between the U.S. The, reform movement? The and aim of this mission, of that mission mm -hmm. that I see through the lines in the article, that they are getting more and more the feeling that the reform movement in Israel is growing, becoming stronger. And this is a mission that came to stop that. This is the message that I see behind the line. Or, and, 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 and Where's that feeling coming from, though? What, what, you know, I, I, I think they see the numbers. They see what is going on in Israel. The reform and the conservative movements are in Israel are getting stronger and stronger. And this is the claim. Stop them. Stop them from getting um, Nahala in the Kotel. Stop them from building synagogues. Stop the rabbis. Stop the Israeli government supporting them. And instead of becoming one united community, one Israel, Israel Achat, I, I, I feel the anger and I feel the fear there. And this yeah. is not the time to do that. Well, you know, here's, you know, the current government is obviously made up of orthodox political parties. No, um, the current government is, is Likud, is right. other parties, part of them are not orthodox. I right. think, uh, yes, there is a But we're influence. still seeing an impact from the Orthodox uh, yes, leadership no on, on certain laws that are being passed right now. So the question is, um, you know, how, how does the reform movement see a way to kind of take control in we terms of We don't want to take control. We don't want to take okay. control. We would like to bring the message that Jews can live not just in the Orthodox arena. They can be reform, conservative, secular, and everything is fine. We have to find a way to live together. All right. Well, We'd like to bring the message that Reform Judaism is a very interesting Jewish community. It suits to many Israelis, them that we call them secular Israelis. And this is the story. And this right. is the fear. And next to Purim, uh, hours before Purim, holiday that united us, this is the story that we have to tell. Not about the fear from the other, but the fear from the other world that is attacking us. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining Pleasure. us, Rabbi. Thank you very much. All right. Over two weeks ago, an Australian woman accused of sexually abusing children in Australia was detained in Israel. The Australian government has been calling on her to be extradited, but now an Israeli court has just ruled that that won't be happening anytime soon because of her alleged mental illness. The courts initially halted the extradition process when the suspect appeared to be suffering from mental illness and claimed she was unfit to stand trial. After investigating her claim more thoroughly, investigators said the woman was faking the symptoms, but now it looks like the court is back to where they started, announcing she is, in fact, suffering from mental disease. <laughs> זה אומר שיהיה פה דיון ארוך של, שאני מעריך אותו יערך במשך כמה שנים עד 
שיוחלט בסוף האם היא ברת השגה על פי ההחלטות שהיו אז ולאור הדברים החדשים שנעשו היום. The Australian government has been trying to extradite the suspects since 2013, and the news comes as a blow to those in Australia who have accused the former principal of sexually abusing them. One of the alleged victims, Dasi Erlich, said she was shocked by the court ruling and still believes the suspect is lying about her mental illness, saying, quote, there's so much evidence it's hard to refute. She's living a normal life in Israel. The suspect, whose name has not yet been cleared for publication, is wanted for 74 charges of sex crimes against young girls. Well, there may be some very good news for Israelis who are planning to travel to the United States. The entire U.S. Senate is calling for Israel to be added to the expedited screening program. And if that happens, Israelis will be able to quickly enter the United States via self-service kiosks at airports. All 100 U.S. senators have reportedly signed a letter calling for the move in recognition of the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence and, of course, flourishing diplomatic relations between the two countries. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection's global entry program already enables travelers from certain countries to more quickly enter the United States. To participate, visitors are required to provide biographical and travel information, including their fingerprints, and pay a $100 fee every five years. The senators believe adding Israel to this program would not only provide Israelis with a smoother visit to the U.S., but would also enhance bilateral law enforcement cooperation. Today, about 1.4 million travelers are enrolled in the program from 14 different countries, including Argentina, Australia, Canada, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Israel has participated in a limited experiment with global entry since 2012, but right now Israelis unfortunately do not enjoy full membership. Nonprofit organizations looking to raise money primarily count on philanthropic donations, but now an Israeli company has a new approach to securing funds. Here to tell us more is the CEO of the Israel Venture Network, Michal Simler. All right, thanks for coming in. So, so give us an understanding of what your organization does. Okay, thank you first of all for joining us. Uh, we are an impact investment organization and we are leading the social businesses ecosystem in Israel. What we're actually doing, we invest in social businesses. We have about 45 social businesses in our uh, portfolio. All of them are about improving the life of this adventured population in Israel. Interesting. So can you give us some examples of yeah, some of, of these organizations? Yeah, let's take, for example, eCommunity, which is in a factory that's located in the north of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they are employee, uh, people with disability through all the spectrum. Wow. And what they are doing over there, they actually are recycling of electronic devices. So it's a normal factory, okay, dealing with uh, uh, recycling, but all the employee, or less, let's say about 80% of the employee are people with disability. So, so here's the question. I mean, how, how are you able to secure other types of funding for organizations like this? We are not securing the fund. We are the actually You're businesses, visit, okay. that, you know, like any other small, medium enterprises, uh, organization or factory or uh, mm -hmm. uh, businesses in Israel, they have their own income generation, but the most important is the social cause, why they exist, why they actually establish, okay? It's about, for example, training people with disadvantage or disability or uh, employee these people. So there, there is a social cause. But not like a normal NGO, they are not looking for the money from philanthropic money or government money, okay? They're responsible to raising their own money from business activity. Interesting. Now, I understand that your organization receives almost half of your funding from the Israeli government, right? Yes, we do. We have three uh, social investment funds. One of uh, the investment funds is a joint venture with the government of Israel. They put about a third of the money, but the, the other money or the other resources for the money came from the business arena and from philanthropic all over the world, mostly in Israel and in the state. Well, this is amazing and uh, very, very important work that you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. All right, now get this. For a long time now, law enforcement agencies have faced serious issues gaining access to the cell phones of criminals and suspects. Well, now an Israeli company is reportedly able to unlock any phone. You may remember the infamous case of the San, Ber the San Bernardino shooter back in 2016. The FBI wanted to be able to search his phone for information related to how he planned out a shooting attack that killed 14 people in December of 2015. But Apple refused to unlock his iPhone because of personal security purposes. The FBI filed a lawsuit against Apple because of this, 
but ended up calling off the hearing because an Israeli company helped him successfully unlock the criminal's phone. Well, that company is called Celebrate, and it's based here in Petah Tikva. Now they claim they can unlock any phone and have even successfully raided an iPhone X for data with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Celebrate hasn't made an official or any official statements about its capabilities, but Forbes is reporting that the company charges as little as $1,500 for a single unlocking. Cheating spouses may want to think twice about what they do on their phones. In response to the reports, Apple has encouraged its users to upgrade to the latest iOS, but hasn't actually denied that its phones could be hacked. Celebrate's tech can reportedly determine or disable a phone's pin, pattern, password, screen locks, or passcodes on the latest Apple and Google Android devices. All right, the Israeli soccer star Eren Zahavi is already known for being one of the best Israeli players of all time. But now he's making even more headlines because he's about to become the highest paid Israeli athlete of all time. Aaron Zahavi has just signed a three-year contract extension with the Chinese soccer club Guangzhou RNF. The 30-year-old will now make a whopping $10 million a year as a base salary. But that's not all. Every time he scores, he'll rake in an additional $20,000 U.S. dollars. In other words, he could end up earning $40 million over the next three seasons. After dominating Israeli soccer and breaking the all-time goal-scoring record in 2016, Zahavi left the Israeli powerhouse Maccabi Tel Aviv in the summer of 2016 to join Guangzhou RNF. At the time, it was for a reported $8 million transfer fee. Not bad, right? Well, since arriving in China, he's taken the league by storm and has even led the league in scoring last year with 27 goals. Best of all, Zahavi has managed to build a massive brand around his game and has even helped Israeli and Chinese companies form business partnerships. Zahavi's got to be feeling good because not one Israeli athlete has ever made close to his new salary in the past. He'll kick off the season this Friday when his team faces their rival, Guangzhou Evergrande. All right, it's happened to all of us. We've all had one of those weak moments where we find ourselves screaming at our GPS for leading us in the wrong direction. But the worst is being stuck in some big public space like the mall with the GPS that just can't seem to pinpoint the exact location that we're looking for. Well, there's some very good news on the horizon because an Israeli startup has created an incredible technology to tackle this very issue. Joining us now is Gideon Rotem, the CEO and co-founder of Duke. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, so tell us a little bit about this technology that you've created. Well, the, the problem with GPS that it's a system 600 kilometers in the air, so it's very hard to pinpoint it. Indoors, impossible. Outdoors, right. when it's dense, etc., very yeah. difficult. Right, and there's what we've done. That. We've did, developed a different system, a new sensor, a new sensor that finds angles of departure from transmitters, from wireless, from all the Wi-Fi, from all the cellular that's around you. So we're using that Wi-Fi, that cellular, to pinpoint your location. So it works inside. It works. Outside, it works in parking lots, it works wherever you are. Wow, this is amazing. And this is more specifically for urban environments, right? So busy places, like we said, the mall as an example. Um, but exactly. it's also applicable to autonomous cars, from what I understood. Autonomous cars will need exact, you know, you, you won't have somebody inside make right. the turn now. Oh, it needs where to make the turn. You need, exactly. Mess up in that situation. So you need a combination of yeah. technologies for that, but that will give you the exact results. In malls, it will give you the exact results. You want to, you know, today they can tell you if you're in the mall, but can they say if you're in front of the, you know, instant uh, coffee, yeah. exactly where you are. The, our technology, 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters. Well, that, okay? that will That's save a lot the of location. our time. I can't tell you how many times I've got, gotten lost in Israel's Dizengoff shopping mall here. Mm -hmm. So I know that I could use this personally. So is, is the technology available yet? No, no. We, we're a seed stage startup. So what we've developed is the sensor, and now we're really raising money and growing to develop the whole system that will enable that. I presume, you know, that will be another 12 or 16 months or something like that, All and right. I'll well, be happy to share it with you here. That absolutely. Next. So for those who are interested in, in investing or learning more, where can they go? Info at Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.
All right, I am so excited about this, and I know for a fact that Israeli soccer fans are already going crazy over this news. It's just been reported that Argentina's national men's soccer team will be traveling to Israel in June for an exhibition match just days before the World Cup kicks off. ILTV's Latin American correspondent Joy Gavijan joins us with the details. Thanks, Natasha. I know I'm so excited also. I never thought I would get to see my country's national team here in Israel. And well, according to reports, the Argentinian national team, including Messi, will arrive in Israel the weekend of June 9th to play a friendly against Israel uh, only a few days before their first game in the World Cup against Iceland. Now, this is really amazing. What has been the feedback in Argentina? Because I'm assuming there are people who are worried that they're going to be playing a friendly match so close to the World yes. Cup, now. Yes, many journalists and fans are worried about the players getting injured. So they're asking if their, their friendly is really necessary. Yeah. So the team is scheduled to fly from their training base in Spain, and people think that the four-hour flight to Israel won't be good for the players. Yeah, and not to mention that after the game, they're also going to need to fly another four hours to Moscow uh, for the big event. But surely Israeli football fans are beyond thrilled right now. Yes. Ever since the announcement, Israeli social media hasn't stopped talking about the match, and even Israeli media outlets have the news on their front mm -hmm. page. No one really wants to miss the chance to see Messi. Yeah, I mean, the, the real question here, though, is what other stars can we expect to come. I saw Messi play with Barcelona in Bloomfield Stadium wow. in Tel Aviv back in 2013, and he's been here, but we haven't really seen any other Argentinian stars. There must be more, right? Yes, yes, for sure. Well, here's the big star, but we also will get to see Di Maria, who plays in France, Aguero, who's killing it in Manchester, yeah. Manchester City, which is currently in the first place of the Premier League, and many, many more. And is there any word where the match will be held yet? Uh, all we know right now is that there are two options, Teddy Stadium in Jerusalem or Sami Offer Stadium in Haifa, mm -hmm. but the Israel Football Association is expect expected to make this decision closer to the date of the match. All right, so do you have any clues about what else the Argentina national team is going to be planning for when they're here? Well, um, early reports are suggesting that the national team will visit the Western Wall and other uh, historical sites in Jerusalem. But there's nothing official so far. Yeah. Last time Messi arrived in Israel, it was a circus, so yes, we can expect it was. the same this time. Yeah, well, I was one of the freaks that was excessively <laughs> celebrating, but I know I'm going to work on getting tickets right away for this. Thank you for all the information, Joy. Thank you. It's officially Purim in Israel, which means thousands upon thousands of Israelis are dressing up in style to celebrate the Jewish people being saved from Haman, an evil hand to the Persian king who was planning to wipe out the Jews in the biblical book of Esther. What a reason to celebrate. Well, dressing up isn't always so simple for kids with disabilities, but luckily one organization has figured out an ingenious way to create holiday outfits. The organization Bet Isi Shapiro is collaborating with industrial design students from the Cholon Institute of Technology to create costumes that incorporate wheelchairs and walkers. This year, 30 kids have been outfitted with incredible designs. There is a Batman in his Batmobile, a fairy sitting in a sparkling flower, and even a Coca-Cola truck. The outfits are so cool, they're putting all of us to shame this Purim. The kids are obviously having so much of a blast with their creative costumes that some of the students behind the designs are reconsidering the future of their careers. One student, Imbar Amir, says, quote, It makes me realize that my studies are not necessarily just for learning how to make nice things for people's homes, but also to make things that have an impact. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, Chag Purim Sameach, or Happy Purim. Today is the first day of the Holy Festival, and if you're wandering around Israel right now, you know that to celebrate, we dress up. That's why today's word is tachposet, meaning costume. Wonder women, monsters, princesses, animals, people wear all kinds of tachposot, or costumes, during Purim. There are also parties with sweets and music and more. And if you're wondering how religious a holiday with these types of parties could possibly be, well, don't worry about it. On Purim, it's actually a mitzvah, or a good deed to drink. Think of it as a sanctioned countrywide Halloween party. So put on that tachposet, get out of the house, and enjoy the holiday. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy with a drop in temperatures to a low of 50 or 10 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect the skies to clear up some in a high of roughly 70 or 20 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.49 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.